I had the honor to meet Dr. Emilio Marrero. He served 32 years as a Navy chaplain and also worked closely with the Marines on two key deployments in Desert Storm in 1991 and with the 1st Marine Expeditionary Force in 2003. He published a book entitled A Quiet Reality. He chronicles his deployment with the Marines. It's a raw telling story about their journey to Babylon, Iraq. He tells me his thoughts on PTSD. When we look at uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, I think that for the most part, um, society in general has taken on the definition of, uh, of the clinicians. And we look at it as a psychological disorder. And we look at the fact that it is a psychological disorder that actually impacts the body physically. And there are some, some real changes that take place in the brain, um, some real chemical changes. And therefore, it becomes very difficult to try and pinpoint where this PTSD is taking place. And when they go into a combat environment and they face a violent, a traumatic event, or they face prolonged um, uh, grief and prolonged trauma or prolonged um, suffering, uh, they begin to then redefine what that looks like. There is, there is a gentleman by the name of Robert Grant who does a great job in his book, The Way of the Wound, that talks about how by using Jean Piaget's uh, a theory uh, of education uh, and cognitive development, he says that most of us, what, what we end up doing is we go through life with an idea of how the world is supposed to function. What PTSD does is it blows a hole in that composite, okay, or, or in that composition. And by blowing a hole in it, now it's left open with an open wound. And the, the idea is that you have to try and reconstruct that and reconstruct it with new information, with new experiences and new ideas, and then bring it all back together so that it can function as a new cognitive model for you for the rest of your life or for the next season in your life. Emilio not only describes a warrior's mindset when they go into battle, but also explains their thought process after a traumatic event. They understand the importance of the mission. Uh, I think the greatest factor, you talk about peer pressure, they want to make sure um, that they don't disappoint their peers. Uh, and in the same way that they want to be able to depend on their peers, they want their peers to depend on them. Um, and that's, that's a huge factor in going in. So they're not going in with a position of weakness or a position of fear. They're going in with the attitude that we're going to do everything we possibly can to get this job done and to do it well and to take care of one another. And I think that's one of the reasons why when someone does get hurt and when someone gets killed, it becomes such a traumatic uh, disappointment because they did everything that they possibly could. One of the differences between post-traumatic stress disorder in combat and PTSD um, that's often treated on the outside from sexual assault victims or crime victims and so forth is that there's a real difference in mentality and in perspective. The person on the outside um, in our society sees themselves as a victim. They were surprised. Uh, part of what happens to them, part of the reason for the trauma is that they realize that their lives were at risk and that their security was in danger. It's the first time that they've really encountered that their security was not assured. Whereas a young Marine or a young soldier or, or a, 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 a sailor or Air Force uh, personnel who goes into combat, they already know that their security is in danger. There's no sense of victimhood. Um, on the contrary, their disappointment comes in themselves because they begin to second guess themselves. They begin to think that somehow they let somebody down, somehow they did something wrong, somehow it's their fault. Um, that things didn't go the way that they wanted or their friend was killed or, or severely wounded and therefore they begin to do a lot of second guessing.
the difference of doing in office therapy and coming here and working in the arena with the horses really decreases the defenses that somebody comes in with. Um, and when you're particularly talking about trauma, any form of trauma, um, you with trauma you bring so much of the past into the present because in the present moment you're still feeling those things. So you might be experiencing the effects of the trauma that you've experienced. Um, you can deal with those feelings now in a healthier way. A lot of people don't have the words that they need to express what's going on. So this allows them a platform to just be in an environment that's non-judgmental, it's laid back, it's relaxed, and they don't need to have words. I feel it's very important for the veterans transition from military life to civilian life. When they leave, they're trained for the combat situations, and when they come back home, there's not a whole lot of training or transitional help, it seems at this point, to help them with overcoming the obstacles that a lot of civilians don't understand. Columbia University conducted a study and found that combat veterans who participate in equine-assisted therapy require less sessions than those in traditional talk therapy, so their PTSD symptoms are reduced at a faster rate. The thought processes and um, responses that were effective in active military life um, may not be things that are um, effective and helpful for the person in their civilian life. And so coming into the arena and working with a horse um, or a group of horses it actually helps to develop a person's interpersonal skills as well. And when we're projecting these things that we're feeling onto a horse and then we see how that horse responds and reacts, uh, it helps to gain insight and awareness into how we do feel, um, how that might be coming out, and how other people in our lives may be perceiving that or experiencing it. And so it really, I think one of the biggest things is increasing that awareness of feelings that might normally be suppressed and we don't want to deal with, um, but we can experience them in a healthy way and in a safe environment. Having been in that environment myself and seeing the ugliest of the ugly and then seeing the really good parts that come from that sense of belonging, it really helps me appreciate the relevance and the significance of what we do here with the veterans and the horses. I wanted to witness the Agala process firsthand. I traveled to Dallastown, Pennsylvania to witness Joe Casal, a veteran from York, Pennsylvania. Uh, I was in the United States Marine Corps from 88 to 96. I was in two conflicts. I was in, in the Republic of Panama in 1989 with the invasion of Noriega, and I was in Operation Desert Storm and Desert Shield in 1991. I was a rifleman and a machine gunner. I left work in 2012 and started to teach karate. I attend a PTSD group out at the York Vet Center and Rick the counselor asked me if I would be interested in coming out here and doing the psychotherapy. And I said, absolutely. My name is Ellie Williams, and I'm the executive director of uh, Equity and Support Services. And we do equine assisted psychotherapy utilizing the AGALA model. The AGALA model is about helping clients with mental health issues find solutions to the problems they face and the challenges they face. We basically run like a regular outpatient therapy clinic, but we utilize horses as part of our our approach. When we work with clients, uh, we have them work in the arena or in the field or in a paddock with the horses and interact with them. Sometimes uh, just, just interacting, just being in that space. It's even just activities that we can create and experience that we can discuss and then relate back to um, everyday life. I am the one of the three BSs, it's the equine specialist at um, so I monitor equine safety, make sure the horses are safe, um, as well as just the environment involving the horses. Um, there's a lot of things outside of the arena that are outside of our control. So um, 
you know, say something were to happen in the distance and spook the horses and, and they um, get to running, just kind of making sure everybody's aware of, of what's going on and, and where they need to be to keep themselves safe. <laughs> This is my first day here at the horse farm and I'm really excited to be here. Because of how uh, sessions are facilitated with the horses, it is a, a very non-threatening environment. I can't get over how shiny their coats are and everything. They moved away from the center. Now all three of them are up. We're really more experience-based and, and not so much kind of face-to-face -face talking. So it allows clients to really navigate through how they're most comfortable. I don't think they mind if somebody comes in here and, you know, they're gentle with them and everything and they're here in peace. But I think if there was like a problem in here, I think, I, I think they would react a little bit. Joe did a great job. He was very present and um, interactive. He appeared to enjoy the uh, interactions with the miniature horses. He seemed to really connect with the horses and sometimes really reflected back to his own life. I didn't ask a lot of um, in-depth questions about his own life today because it was the first session. Um, and those will come in later sessions. I was telling Ellie that I was a little nervous when I was driving down here. I wasn't too sure what to expect. But once I got in there and started to, you know, move around a little bit and started to work with the horses, I felt a lot better. One of my triggers would be like being hyper vigilant all the time, always looking around wherever I go, locking doors and all that kind of stuff. So being here, it kind of put me at ease and I wasn't so hyper vigilant when I came here. I found it fascinating when Ellie explained how horses tend to mirror human behavior. It was even more fascinating to witness Joe's response. Like today with Joe, uh, the horse is moving away and what that experience might be like for him with the horses leaving or just being still on it. I think he, he spoke of it as being like family. And uh, it is really interesting how they can really pick up on those emotions. We expected Joe to develop more of a bond with the horses in this session, but we did not anticipate what you'll see next. What the little cone represents is a booby trap. And these are bunkers. Get our for it. Movie trap, bunker, movie trap. We'll have the movie trap, and then that would be the last thing that we clear, and then we would come out, jump up, climb out of the trenches. So we would come down into the trenches, and then we would deactivate the booby trap here. And then once we got there, we were working with three horses in different areas with him. And they kept going in the same positioning, almost a triangle. Um, and he kind of picked up on that as being his fire squad when he was actually in the military. And that that's the positioning that they would be in and that it was a position of being safe because they were all there together, kind of doing their own roles. So that was really kind of cool. Jump up, pull ourselves out of the trenches, and then continue to more trenches. You've had so much trauma and complex trauma and traumatic things happening, whether in combat or um, the, any experience like that. Your amygdala just takes over. I mean, that, that part of your brain is that fight or flight or freeze. 
and they get stuck with that and the prefrontal cortex just doesn't doesn't register doesn't know how to tell the brain that it is safe um, and I believe that we're helping him through the equine assisted psychotherapy experience in the moment that it, this is a safe place there are safe places and he's able to take that home with him which is so powerful and fascinating in just such a short time seeing how that changes you shared that your team came out so I, right. I don't want to just assume I want to clarify that you were successful we were successful we came out and then we went to the next set of trenches to do so we would just keep going and going and going until there were no more trenches are, are these team members the same for you we were with that team for maybe a few years. I mean, we all trusted each other, you know, I mean, we would die for each other. It was a bond. As you were going through that, that memory and that, that process to have those there. Well, it, it was nice because I was able to think clearly. I mean, if I was just doing this with nobody, I, I don't know if I would have been able to go through with it. I could go through scenario by scenario, but the one scenario that I set up last week was like one of them that was really um, a life and death situation, you know? So that kind of stuck with me. And that's something I would think about every day, maybe one time, a hundred times. But last week I, I didn't really think about it at all. And when I was getting anxiety, either I would I would uh, think about, you know, my experiences, think about something nice over here, think about the horses, think about Ellie, think about whatever, something over here. Everything here is positive. So, and that's, that's helped me. I didn't take my anxiety medicine all week. So it's like, that's like the first time, you know, it's huge. I mean, my psychiatrist is gonna be like, wow, you know, because, you know, I mean, I, I don't want to be on a boatload of medicine, you know what I mean? But it's nice not, you know, having to take that because after taking it, I was always, I was done for the rest of the day. You know, I would be tired, I'd be groggy. My wife would be like, geez, you know, you're not doing nothing all day. And it was a good experience. My journey continued in Kingsville, Missouri at Camp Valor Outdoors. I met with retired Major John Schwent, the founder and director. In 2010, John was asked to work with the Department of Defense. He coordinated the Wounded Warrior Paralympic events across the country. But then he wanted to do even more. Warriors were being reconnected um, through competition and sport and outdoor activities. That was kind of the, the brainchild of um, why we started Camp Valor Outdoors. We use the outdoors as an excuse, really, to get together and go have fun through guided hunting, fishing, shooting, archery, four-wheeling, just any reason or request that we have that warriors would like to try something, we figure out a way to make it happen and let's go do it.
we went on a fishing trip with a group of veterans who were overseas many years ago, and then some just a few years ago. We witnessed the bonds they formed as they waited for a bite at the other end of their fishing rod. This was not just any fishing trip though. True healing was taking place. I had no clue what to expect whenever I got here. I wasn't nervous at all because I was gonna be around other veterans, so it's more of a, a comfort factor, I guess you could say. Just being able to connect with other veterans and and being able to get that camaraderie back a little bit. Oh man. Yeah. I had an 84 Ford Ranger, three <laughs> bashed in doors, a bashed in fender, a 2.6 six cylinder or 2.8 six cylinder. That wasn't one of the crap. Just been a blast since I've been there. The camaraderie that was pretty cool that is established within this camp is phenomenal. The people in the community that lend their support to John and his efforts to make this speechless. Um, I had a wonderful time and uh, lifelong memories, lifelong friends. It may be shocking, but some veterans, even those with PTSD, actually want to pull a trigger again. So let's go down and score. Flip flop your partner. In many instances, we never close the loop on making this warrior whole again after injury. And they may have been blown up, they get medevaced out. Um, you know, ultimately going through Germany or back to the States to Walter Reed or Bethesda, and then when they get healed enough, then they go home. Uh, but they never put the uniform back on or put the weapon back in the warrior's hand where he felt the most comfortable, the most confident. We look at it as we're trying to make the warrior whole again. So we don't hesitate to put um, the gun back into their hands. John and his team teach the warriors a shooting technique that is different from their military training. They're taught breathing techniques while they focus their minds and relax their muscles, akin to traditional meditation. Because there's so many therapeutic attributes of the actual art of shooting, uh, we formalized uh, our recreational shooting into a competitive shooting of about six months ago. We teach warriors and train them from the combat style shooting that we've all learned to precision shooting and trying to shoot one hole on top of the other using service rifles and service pistols that we carried in the military. To be a successful competitor in the shooting sports um, and to try to shoot really tight groups, um, it requires uh, an intense focus, a more um, control over your body and to relax your muscles uh, to achieve true bone-on-bone -bone support to support that weapon system um, so you can get real natural point of aim which is required to shoot very tight groups. I do this and I do this with my eyes closed it's the same movement it is all perception of what you will accept yeah. in that wobble area just relax and pull the trigger. They're more willing to learn um, what it takes um, to learn those attributes to control your body, um, to re truly relax, and then to understand the mental component of shooting. Um, it's very mental. I went through a, uh, a meditation class, mindfulness therapy, if you will, and a lot of it actually transfers over to competitive shooting where it helps you refocus, and that's what meditation is really about, is your ability to, everybody's mind wanders and drifts at times, and it's your ability to refocus. And out here, it, shooting is very much a mental program. Uh, you have to be able to clear things out of your brain, think about executing one individual shot. Tell my fiance, so it's just, to me, it's relaxing. She thinks it's funny that shooting guns is relaxing, but it, it is to me. Their anxieties, uh, their anger issues, uh, the explosion of their emotions, uh, we have to control that in our shooting sports or you won't be successful or as successful. And so those attributes that we teach not only help them become a more a competitive shooter uh, in a competitive environment, but it also helps them become a better man and father and husband off the firing line uh, because they understand that these are all triggers that they can control 
when they're taught the techniques to control them. Everybody here at Camp Valor, whether it's a guide, coach, another competitor, another hunter, fisherman, whatever, woman, they become my brothers, my sisters, family. I don't have any brothers of my own, but I have thousands of brothers in the military. We create the environment that allows them to open up with fellow warriors who understand and there's no judging. You know, we don't care what your problems are because we all have problems, so we're all normal. You got to meet similar people like myself. That's another good thing because you, you can actually talk to somebody when they actually know what you're talking about, you know, using weird words that they just use in the military and they understand exactly what you're saying. And if you talk to a civilian, you got to spend 20 minutes explaining every word you use, and it gets kind of overwhelming at times. Volunteers prepared a sizable feast for the warriors at the end of the competition. They shared common life experiences, both triumphs and obstacles. Everybody gets each other. They understand a lot of the challenges. And it's interesting to just be able to sit down and talk with other guys or gals uh, that have gone through some of their own challenges and helping each other work through things. I'll never be, you know, champion at camp here or anything. That's not, you know, my, my goals, but um, I love shooting. I like competing. I want, to, I want to do the best I can, you know, every time I go out. And I want to try to get better and better, and, and this has given me to, to you know, to, to do a, a new hobby that, that I've really given up on doing. So, so I, I appreciate everything that John has done, and, and uh, I'm, I'm having a great time. If it wasn't for hunting and fishing and now shooting, I'd be one of the 22. Because I've been there, it's not a great place to be. And being here with these guys, it just makes the whole world difference. You always have somebody to call, somebody to talk to. It doesn't matter if it's three o'clock in the morning or we've been up for five days straight, we'll be there. There was another army uh, soldier who went with us. Um, he got blown up in Iraq. His was in an armored Humvee and it blew up and his leg you know, bent back over and his, um, his buddy uh, got killed in that blast. And so he had been, they said a total of like 16 surgeries on this leg. He shared a story um, with part of his testimony when he was in Iraq. Um, he was on patrol and um, the kids that were there were saying, GI, bomb, bomb, bomb in the ditch. And so they went and moved this tin sheet and there was a, a Motorola phone that said, missed call one minute ago. And so he lives with um, you know, why did that not go off? He knew it didn't go off, and there had been some previous patrols of his unit that had been blown up along this road. And then another warrior who was on this event, another soldier who was um, in Afghanistan with the exact same story of a Motorola phone, different country, different patrol, and, you know, it said missed call one minute ago. And so they live with these horrors of their, their buddies being blown up, and, and why not me? Uh, because they should have been. And so that's a struggle that they live with. Yet we reconnected these guys with the exact same stories. Um, different uh, environment, different countries. And so what they experience, they recognize that there's other warriors that they're not alone. And that they know that there's now friends and other battle buddies who have the same experiences and living with the same stuff. And you can talk to somebody. And just having somebody to talk to about the struggles that you're having um, is a key component of what we do. Outdoors saved my life, and what John is doing here is a great thing. It's a life-changing experience. Veterans leave here different. They don't know why they're different. Why they're different. They don't know how they've changed. And when they go home, their lives see it. Their families see it. They can't explain it. Their therapist. They, the therapist can see it, but they don't know what happened. So they walk away with confidence, with a smile, with an inner self calmness, peacefulness. And I just want to say thank you to them because it's been the most life changing experience, and I want to go pay it forward to other veterans. So thank you so much for everything.
Joe was introduced to a larger horse in this session. At first, we didn't know what his reaction would be. We hoped his trust would increase in the arena with his assembled equine team. Maybe spend a few minutes being where you're comfortable, whether it's outside or inside, just getting to know um, any that are new in here. And, uh, and then we'll move into an activity. Okay. okay. So I'm gonna step in and... Uh... I'll step in as well. Okay. I like how he's going to the bigger. Mm -hmm. I'm putting his hand on. I wonder what it is about food yeah. for Joe. Create something using anything in the arena that might help you to help keep that anxiety low for you this week. When we first met Joe um, for the tour, he was very hypervigilant, um, very much making sure that his, uh, his back was covered, um, always keeping an eye out, being sure uh, where the horses were, very unsure of the larger animals, um, wanting to work with the smaller. And uh, he just seemed so much more relaxed and um, just less anxious, less hypervigilant, um, peaceful, and uh, in a better place. In martial arts, we do a lot of, especially during the spring and summertime, we do a lot of training outside. And some of us bring our, our pets or animals to, the, to our training facility outside where we train. So I was picturing like being in a, a spot where we train and bringing the horses in as therapy for the students, for the young students. But I think being with, with the horses helps me open up more. You know, because if the horses weren't here, I don't think I'd be talking about anything to be quite candid with you. Teaching karate, coming to Equiteam, and staying productive keeps Joe's anxiety low and his PTSD in check. But if he isolates, he said, his depression and anxiety do resurface. My spirit is being fed. You know, when my spirit starts dying, you know, it's not, not very good. By my fourth visit, Joe reaches a major milestone. He recognizes one horse's anxiety and acts as the comforter in session number six. When I was driving over, sometimes I experience anxiety and I could just come up for no reason at all. Even when I'm at home, it just kind of just happens all of a sudden. Um, and it feels like I got butterflies in my stomach. So when I was driving over, I was experiencing anxiety and then once I got onto the farm, it was like it was lifted. It just went away. When it snowed the other day, um, this horse and another horse were standing outside of this area, and the snow fell off the roof onto the top of it. So this is the first time he's been back in this place since then. So um, I think it's kind of a neat parallel of there's been something right. that's been um, traumatizing, um, that's been difficult and scary, and now he's back in this place. Okay. And so we're just going to invite you, Joe, to just help, <coughs> help him be comfortable in this place. Right. Today, the one horse to me was, uh, seemed like it was having a little anxiety. So I kind of, and that was giving me a little anxiety. So what I had to do to balance it out is kind of 
you know, stay, stay moving in the moment and move around with the horse so I could balance it out so both of us would feel a lot better. To have the horse be in the arena with Joe and to kind of watch him help the horse work through that. Um, and definitely he, he had said that he had picked up on, on the anxieties of the horse and just his way of managing that and helping the horse figure out how to manage that. That was really neat. It's working through the horses and the horses experience. And this was a wonderful opportunity and such a parallel. And it was just a neat experience to see Joe pick that horse just by happenstance. And he was able to really connect with him. A lot of things came up for him um, in the session in regards to anxiety and how to keep working through that. My spirit was really good when I got onto the property and then it even got better when I was mingling with the horses. Warrior's best friend was not far from my home near Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. A family-owned nonprofit, the Jeffers also have family members in the military. Good boy, yes. What kind of makes us unique is that all of our dogs come from animal shelters. Um, so we, we kind of get to make an impact on and two lives through what we do. So we get to rescue a dog and they spend about six months of training with us. And then um, when they're trained, then that's when we place them with a veteran with post-traumatic stress and traumatic brain injury. I'm the lead canine trainer for Warrior's Best Friend. Um, so I'm in charge of going out and evaluating um, the dogs at the shelters and picking candidates that would fit for our program. Um, and then afterwards, I bring them back and I train them four to six months. And then after they complete their training, we select the veterans to be placed with our dogs. They come here and stay for nine days. I actually go out with them. It's usually like a, maybe nine to five Thing every day um, and we go out and take them everywhere they would um, you know go with their families or be put in stressful situations to let them know and teach them how to, to handle um, being in those situations so we take them to uh, zoos um, you know that's a hard one for the dogs. <laughs> kind of a, an intricate process. There's a lot of thought and consideration that goes into pairing a dog with a veteran. I mean, if we do have the opportunity, we'll set up a meeting beforehand so that they can meet and bond and um, see if it's a good match. They brought her over and, and it was just like, it was almost like love at first sight. It was just, it was probably like the coolest thing ever. They just, you know, brought her over and she was really excited to see the other dog and well, the cat, not so much, but. The cat ran. <laughs> but you know we all just like oh, this is like the coolest dog ever and you know even when she finally got finished with training and we all just kind of like became a really great family and she's totally one of the gang but it was it was totally like love at first sight the human canine bond is dynamic so much so Eva and Michael said they feel protected when they venture out with their canine daughter. I didn't know him when he was in for like the last probably year I, I met him when he was working in Leavenworth. He's definitely come out of his shell a lot more. He, he'll actually go out places on his own. Um, so he's not so much the prisoner in his own home anymore. He'll talk to people a lot more. Um, you know, a lot more people will stop and be like, oh, what a pretty dog. And, you know, he'll actually stop and talk to those people. And, and before, I, I really doubt he would. PTSD kind of like, you know, kind of shuts you off from people and you don't want to talk to people. And, and so I think that that's really helped a lot with that. At this juncture, I knew there had to be research on the human-animal bond and this path to healing. 
Samantha suggested I visit with Dr. Rebecca Johnson at the University of Missouri in Columbia. So here at the Research Center for Human-Animal Interaction, we study the benefits to both ends of the leash when we put humans and companion animals together in interesting ways. We conducted a project with uh, military veterans recently deployed and OEF and OIF uh, veterans in which they came together in um, classes to train dogs who were rescued from the shelter, animal shelter, in basic obedience. But the point of the exercise of the study for veterans was that they would seek a sense of comp uh, accomplishment, that they would work together in a goal to train an animal in basic obedience. And what happened was the dogs would reach the canine good citizenship level, the AKC test that is commonly accepted for good obedience through the training of, uh, done by the veterans in our classes. And what we wanted to see was whether or not we could influence the veterans' post-traumatic stress levels, their family adjustment levels, and other social indicators, meaning did they feel more socially engaged with others and positive about themselves. And we found that they were feeling these things, that their mood improved, that their social interaction improved, and that they really enjoyed the idea that they were training the dogs. Some of the veterans in our classes volunteered to then take the dog home with them and be the dog's trainer 24 seven. And that was a very uh, powerful experience for them. And it was also very rewarding. So we had veterans training service dogs for other veterans. And one thing you always know about veterans is they will do anything for another veteran. And this was a high motivator for them. It was also very rewarding because when we placed the dog with its veteran that it was going to help, there was such pride and such excitement and it was a very joyous uh, encounter for them. Veterans are really making significant strides while training at Warrior's Best Friend, and the months after, they bring their service dog home. To come into training and begin to see some small and subtle changes, but then, you know, a couple weeks and months down the line to get these um, updates and feedbacks from our veteran and say, like, hey, I'm going out to Baker University and I'm doing a campus tour because now I, I can go back to school. Or to get a picture from one of our teams at Disney World with his four girls and his wife and say, you know, this would not have been possible if I didn't have my service dog. I would have never dreamed of even being able to do this. Although Michael didn't share his deployment experience on camera, he did say traditional therapy didn't work for him. His therapist only wanted him to talk about his traumatic event, which caused more anxiety. They're getting to um, regain their independence and kind of become again, you know, just the happy, thriving, wonderful people that they were um, and be able to live and enjoy life to the fullest. There is no one in this world who has enough unconditional love in their life. Animals provide that without judging you without being concerned whether you have a disability or a challenge. They just provide unconditional love. And that, I think, is the crux of the uh, success of these kinds of interventions. It was more of a family affair for Joe's last session. We asked him to bring his wife so she can witness what Joe had experienced for the past eight weeks. She would deeply appreciate being there. It gave them an opportunity to experience Joe's equine team together. So usually what we do is when we have our last session, um, it's really for closure and for just kind of, you know, spending time and really enjoying and anything that you need to to, to be okay to move on. Right. I know you shared that you're gonna give us a ring occasionally and pop back. Yeah. So it's not the end of the end. Right. I was thrilled that uh, Joe brought his wife today. Uh, she had a lot of questions about kind of how everything worked. I feel that Joe tends to keep things to himself um, at home. And it was great to have the opportunity to share that with his wife. Not only the experience here with the equine therapy, but to be able to have the comfort to be able to talk to her even in the future as well. 
I believe and I feel that he has had a lot of aha moments, uh, increased self-awareness through the interactive nature of the work that we do. And he's able to then remember that and take it with him. And then when he has other issues or times of anxiety or heightened awareness, um, being hypervigilant, he's able to then remember how he was able to reduce the anxiety and be okay in different situations. So I think, you know, the experiences here will really help him as he moves forward. This will definitely help me uh, kind of focus and balance when I deal with a trigger. They call that grounding. When you're thinking about something different, maybe there's fireworks or whatever, then I, I would take out my phone and I would look at pictures, maybe from my time that I was here. It's really been a cool thing to witness and, and I was excited that Joe chose to use different horses at times, but also to use the same quite a bit, um, just because it, it kind of gave some, some similarity to each from session to session, so it was neat. Make sure they end up in the barn and not the car. <laughs> I, I hope that we can reach more vets and that Joe comes back to see us. <laughs> When people have a relaxing experience that's universally positive, it distracts them in a way that changes their neuroendocrine response. So we know that when people interact with a companion animal, and we consider companion animals to include horses, that there is an increase in oxytocin levels, an increase in serotonin levels, and other hormones as well, a decrease in cortisol, which is the stress hormone, that uh, generally can put the person in a more positive frame of mind and then their body is more receptive to what they're doing and so we can have this whole spiral upward of things improving based on the positive interaction with the horse, the horse is non-judgmental, they have other veterans they're communicating with, they feel a relaxation response. We can say from our findings uh, that this was an effective intervention for our veterans. Hey, how are you? Good, good, good. Good, good. good to see you. Good to see you too. And happy belated Veterans Day. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we, uh, last night I was out up towards Stroudsburg uh -huh. to attend the, the Marine Corps Ball. Oh. Uh, the awesome. Marine Corps birthday is on the 10th, uh -huh. but we celebrate on Veterans Day. It's been about a year. Yeah, I think the last time. So a year has here, passed. Yeah, yeah. And how have you been doing? Oh, I'm doing good. I mean, uh, I'm still doing everything that that I was doing before, plus a little bit more. Uh, for an example, I I joined a motorcycle club. Nice. So, and the motorcycle club is out of Virginia. Our mother chapter is out of Virginia, okay. and they're called the Defenders of Liberty, and we're a Patriot club. Mm -hmm. We're not an outlaw club or anything like that, and we do a lot of stuff with the veterans. Uh, I'm still doing the dog service training Great. with my dog. Mm -hmm. She's been in it for about, I'd say about a year and a half now. Okay. So she, she's coming along. Mm -hmm. She's not a full-fledged service dog yet, but mm -hmm. it's, it's going to happen. It's just going to take a little more time than okay. I expected. Hey, how you doing? Good to see Good you. Good to see you too. How you doing? Oh, it's been good. Yes. yes. Hey, you? Katie, how are you? Good. All right. Good to, good to see you too. Yeah. But I don't know if you want to see. Yeah. Who's familiar? Who might see anything? Hey. It's like, it almost feels like I, I just, I never even left, you know, it's kind of like I've had some dreams and stuff about them. When the horses were in my dreams, they were, they were really good dreams. And it's nice to have some good dreams because the nightmare ones are, are pretty bad.
The Igala process is a game changer. It's highly effective for veterans and an integral part of a more holistic approach to combat PTSD. Being around them tends to sort of take you away from your own yeah. brain and what's going on and you can just sort of watch them and, and be with them. And if it goes back into your head and then something comes out of it, that's fine. But if it doesn't, that's fine too. Mm -hmm. It sort of organically will happen how it needs to happen. And he said earlier, it was really neat. He said, you know, I have some additional tools in my toolbox. Mm -hmm. So it's really helping them create that toolbox and experience that and know that they have it, but we're still here if they need some additional support. Across the board, the veterans are coming to us and saying, I've been over-medicated, or um, I think that almost mismedicated. Yeah, yeah. mismedicated yeah. or over-medicated, or just um, I've had this trauma and I've um, they prescribed me this and I just feel numb. And just not then avoiding feeling about anything and then uh, through different programs whether it's veterans court or through the VA on different therapeutic services being able to then either correctly medicate or not be medicated as much to be able to then have feelings in a safe way not being overwhelmed um, to be able to deal with the trauma because if you don't deal with it it's not going to go away with Joe being able to work through um, some of his challenges or some things that have stuck with him and then to come back the next week and say, I haven't had to take my anxiety medication mm -hmm. all week is so powerful and huge. And it just shows the need for that processing through and that interaction you know, therapeutically. Dr. Marrero does shed light on a harsh reality. Even though warriors do seek help, they progress at a very different rate, and it could take decades for some. I have a close friend uh, who's a chaplain who has been receiving care, and, and it's heartbreaking to see that it's taking years for him to be able to, to sort of bounce back, and he still needs a lot of work. And I think this is one of, one of the things that we need to be very conscientious of. Um, this is not like breaking a bone and you set it and it mends and you move on. This is really about reestablishing uh, a sense of identity and reestablishing a sense of purpose um, and it takes time. I like what General Mattis, um, now Defense Secretary Mattis says, and that is that we need to stop looking at PTSD as PTSD meaning post-traumatic stress disorder as a disorder because a disorder is an illness that uh, continues to degrade over time, but that there are actually elements. And perhaps we need to look at PTSD as PTSG, which is post-traumatic stress growth, so that we understand that once we've been in, in, engaged in this kind of a theater and in this kind of an environment, that all of us need time and space and we need resources to grow into uh, who we want to be, who, where we need to be, and it's just a matter of growth. Some folks will get there faster because their experiences perhaps were less intense and other folks will get there uh, over a longer period of time because they need a little bit more care, a little bit more reflection, um, and just a little bit more time. I was humbled to have met such an extraordinary group of warriors while gaining more insight on PTSD and the complementary therapies that offer a different path. I was amazed not only by their courage and strength to move forward, but also by their unwavering service to pay it forward to fellow warriors and their families. When we deploy on foreign soil, we're never alone. We never go to battle alone. But unfortunately, back here when we come home, we all go back to our communities alone. There's over 75% of 2.4 million lawyers who've deployed over the last 15 years who's going through a divorce. Over 60% of them have post-traumatic stress or traumatic brain injury. So they're struggling to find their way. They're struggling to find what they left back home and it's not there in the community. So it's, it's upon us to, to fill that void and do what we do as veterans 
and our family and our veteran communities to reach out and make a difference in the lives of ill injured and wounded veterans, and that's what we do. We need to be able to reach vets and give them an opportunity to reconnect with other veterans. Uh, this organization, it's outstanding. You make amazing friends, but it's also a great support group. And, and it's, it's for veterans, it's about veterans, and we're about helping other vets. Uh, the warrior came to me and says, John, I got this present for you. He reached in his pocket, and before I could even say anything, he pulls out a bullet. He goes, I wanted to give you this bullet. And uh, it was a nine millimeter bullet. And he goes, I want you to have that. He goes, I, um, I reloaded that. I'm looking at it, nine millimeter bullet. I'm thinking, oh, okay, that's a nice bullet. I'm thinking to myself, I reload, you know, and that's good. He goes, no, I want you to have it. I reloaded that for me. And I'm looking at it and in my mind, I'm thinking, I reload for me too. Uh, I wasn't getting it. And, uh, and he knew I wasn't getting it. And then uh, he, uh, he looked at me and said, uh, I cut the gunpowder with mercury to make sure it'd do the job. And then he had my attention. He goes, you know, after last month's duck hunt, he had no idea the, the position that I was in. Two weeks earlier, I thought about taking my life. And the only reason why I didn't was because I was looking forward to this event. And I got to go to that event and reconnect with other warriors and uh, it changed my life. I left with a mission that I can do something and give back and help. He goes, so I don't longer need that bullet. And uh, so since then, um, he has become one of our guides, our biggest advocates of giving back, picking up warriors, driving them. He comes in here for guiding other words of turkey hunting and deer hunting. And so, you know, for that day, I know there wasn't 22 that committed suicide because he told me it saved his life. And so, you know, there's a lot of programs and uh, that they wonder if they're making a difference. And I don't have any doubt that we're making a difference because they tell me. These organizations are expanding their reach like many others in the U.S. and continue to make an impact in their communities. These heroes provide hope for our nation's heroes as they take the journey back to normal. Norman Rice said this really profound quote that we really like to hinge on when we feel like we're not sure what the next step is. Um, and the quote goes, uh, dare to reach your hand into the darkness to pull another hand into the light. So every one of us got goose months when we heard that, that phrase and we knew that's really the heart of what we're doing is we're, we're daring to reach out to those men and women that need it the most and the off chance that we can bring them back into a good place.